one of the biggest problems with social media is that it, it introduces at the national level all of the worst politics of a very small town. Before the war between the states, you could have something that happened in Alabama and it would be a month before people in New Hampshire found out about it. Uh, and now yeah. everybody knows about it by the end of the day, whether it's a, a police shooting of a young black man or if it's uh, some uh, episode on a college campus where conservative speakers shouted down, mm -hmm. everybody goes to their corner, everybody knows about it right away, and everybody is pretty much inflamed. Yeats wrote his, his great poem, The Second Coming, the center, the center does not hold. Now, either Americans, because of our unique dedication to individual pursuit of happiness, don't require a center, you know, we, we don't need a center, or like every other nation, we need some sort of center, some sort of gathering point mm -hmm. that, I, and I'm with you, I'm nervous at mandatory uh, centers, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> mandatory centers seem like concentration camps or re-education camps, but there was nobody made a rule that American garden hoses had to be green, but they're, right. but they're all green. Nobody made a rule that our, our school buses all have to be yellow, but, but they're yellow. There are certain cultural mm -hmm. assumptions that go into what characterizes an American spirit or demeanor, et cetera. And that cannot come from the passage of a law, but it needs to come from somewhere. And I'm wondering if the reason we're lacking it is because we of, of a loss of purpose or just a horizontal plane eschatology. Before, when there was the West to settle, uh, Manifest Destiny was a, I think, a misshapen eschatology, but it was, mm -hmm. there was an eschatological component to it. Right. There's a great book, How Football Explains America. Um, mm -hmm. And a football game is a territorial game. The, the ball right. marks, marks how much territory you've conquered, and it's a manifest destiny game. <laughs> right. right. Now we're all standing around. Oh, what do you want to do? Oh, I don't know. I want to smoke pot. I want to run a small business. That, how are you going to keep it going with that? Yeah, I mean, I... I hear what you're saying, and I, I, I definitely agree with you about the problem of instantaneity. And put it this way, one of the things that's creating this, you know, when you mentioned about uh, something could happen in Alabama and it take a month for someone in New Hampshire to come out with, hear about it. And this is a point Megan McArdle has made, is that one of the biggest problems with social media, particularly Twitter, is that it brings, it, it introduces at the national level all of the worst politics of a very small town. Right. <laughs> where you have all uh -huh. of a sudden you see someone living wrong um, 2,000 miles away, but that distance is compl entirely collapsed. Right. And so a huge amount of our culture war arguments are about people living the wrong way in communities that are separated by a continent. You know, my, my friend and colleague David French got into all this stuff about the drag queen story hour. But just, you know, let's stipulate for a second that Drag Queen Story Hour is a bad idea that I would not, I would oppose it at a library and all these kinds of things. But I am sure 150 years ago, some bad things happened in California or New York or whatever that Californians and New Yorkers never heard about. Right. And now the problem is it's all in your face, like the Covington High School kids. All of a sudden, everybody has this will to power about imposing how to live on other people, even though the only thing that connects them is this bizarre invention of social media. Well, I agree with you that Americans used to have a more unifying ethos, which was both good and bad, depending on the particulars. Yeah. Um, but I am very much skeptical in all my arguments with the nationalists and the post liberals and the Catholic integration integralists and all of these different groups, I am, I am deeply skeptical that many Americans a hundred years ago, 50 years ago, who weren't in the army or living through a war ever got out of bed and said, okay, what am I going to do today as an American? 